I want to welcome everyone to uh, Palestinian Right of Return with Ziad Abbas. Uh, Ziad Abbas. And, um, we are, my name is Jeremy. I'm a member of the International Socialist Organization and Palestine Action Network from uh, the Bay Area. Um, Ziad is the director of Middle East Children's Alliance um, in Berkeley. Um, so I'm just going to hand it right over to him. He's going to be talking about the Palestinian Right of Return and the Nakba. Good morning. So I'll start my presentation with Arabic language. It's okay? Yeah. I want to punish you at morning. <laughs> anyway, first of all, I am not the director. I'm just a staff oh, member. That's okay. <laughs> uh, and I will walk. I can't sit down. I have a problem with sit down. My name is Ziad Abbas. I was born in the Hesha refugee camp near Bethlehem. Do you know Bethlehem city? Yeah, yeah. you know Bethlehem, of course, where Jesus was born. Yes. So me and Jesus, we were born in the same city. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is the truth. Yeah. Yeah. My family uprooted from a village called Zakaria. <clears throat> In 1948, they came to the Hesha refugee camp. And since that period, my family is still living there in the camp. But I will share with you a little bit about my personal story as a family. But before that, because the goal of the conference, <coughs> I'm going to speak a little bit about what's going on in the Arab world and how all the changes, the new changes in the Middle East will impact the issue of right of return. And we need to be very careful. And to be honest with you, when I speak about the issue of right of return, I don't take in my concern. I want to say something to please the people. And I don't say something just to make the things that's very simple and easy, etc. I say the things as it is. Because the matter of fact, me personally, I am a Palestinian refugee. This is why when he asked me how I want to, me to present you, I am here because I am a Palestinian refugee. And to be a refugee, it's not something just, I am a refugee and we are the human cause and the suffering that the Palestinian refugees go through, went through since 1948 until now and still facing this kind of suffering, <clears throat> the idea is how we see the, the future, how we see the solution. And with that, I need to take you back a little bit to the history. And before I start, actually, I did few researches as a refugee about my village, about my family, And I read a few books, not that much, because my main resource actually my mom, my uncle, and other writers. But I want to recommend before I start, and a lot of information I use, it's related to this book. The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. How many of you read this book? It's not enough. <laughs> I know there are a few copies outside, but this is amazing document. If you support Palestinian right of return, or if you are against right of return, you need to read this book. This is something very important. I'm not just the idea of marketing the book, but the information inside this book. It's very, very, very important to understand the issue of right of return. <clears throat> So I want to take you back a little bit to the history. And here I'm trying to use the technology. I don't know refugees and technology, how it will work. <laughs> but we will try. I will move a lot. <clears throat> this is Palestine, 1878. This is the map of Palestine, 1878. Long time ago. And this is actually even <clears throat> 19 years before the first Zionist conference. 
And all what you see here, the red, the red color, the red points, it's the Palestinian villages and Palestinian cities. And the black one is the big cities where Jewish and Christian and Muslims, they are living together. And why I choose this actually map? Because here, do you have the, no. This is the first Israeli or Zionist settlement built in Palestine, 1878, long, long time ago. And this settlement called Betah Tikva. This is the first Zionist settlement built in Palestine, Betah Tikva. The original name of the village there, it's called the Mlabbis. And in this period, actually, 1878, many Jewish immigrants came to Palestine. Most of them came from Russia and around that area. Around 25,000 Jewish people immigrated to Palestine. And this is during like the Zionist leaders when they try to push toward <coughs> Palestine. Before they decided they want Palestine, before they decided their own conference, they are going to to choose Palestine, some of the Israeli leaders, Zionist leaders in that period, they were pushing the Jewish people to go to immigrate to, toward Palestine. In, 1870, in 1897, the first Zionist conference, and of course, most of you heard about that, they had three proposals, right? Three countries, they, were, they discussed three countries where they want to build the homeland for the Jewish people. <coughs> Uganda, Argentina and Palestine. The people in Uganda and Argentina, they were lucky. <laughs> we in the Palestine, we got, they decided to have it in Palestine. <clears throat> and after that, of course, they start increasing the Jewish uh, immigrants to Palestine. And during that period, we were under the Ottoman occupation. And the Ottoman, that period, they were very weak. They didn't pay attention. Actually, they were focusing on the taxes and the money they get it from the Palestinian people, like many other countries in that area, which the Ottoman in the end. And this is actually the way how the, I can say, the Zionists used the weakness of the Ottoman Empire in that period. I will not spend that, that, that much time in the history, but I want to go more, actually, around that. But I want to take you, when we think about what's going on in the Arab world right now, we need to go back to one of the, main, the most important agreement in the beginning of the century in the Middle East. It's called <coughs> Sykes Pico. Did you hear about Sykes Pico? Yeah. How they divided the Middle East, the British Empire, the French, and they divided the Middle East to different countries, and they build the borders, not build, but design the borders where England will focus part of Iraq, Jordan, Palestine, Egypt, and France will take Syria, Lebanon, and go until like the Moroccan areas, countries, and they divided this area. And there is a goal behind this agreement where they keep the Middle East not to be stable. The idea of the division, not to keep the Middle East stable at all. And this is still in back the Middle East until now. <clears throat> in 1917, you know, Bill for Declaration, November 2nd, 1917. And it's very simple. Sometimes when I think about it, even when I do my presentation in high schools or universities, I say it's very simple. Do you have a car? I will give you his car. <laughs> Me, I will give you his car. And this is like in the history, the empire, this is what they used to do. I will, it's not their land. They promised the Jewish people to, the, to give them the land of Palestine. And by the way, this is the same issue with Philippines. If you go to the history of Philippines, actually they sold the land. Spain, they sold the land for the United States. How many million dollars? It's a few million dollars, actually, in that period. Part of the Philippines, the same. They gave it to the, the Spanish occupation, they gave it to the American. <clears throat> and this is like the empires, how they function, and sometimes decide the future of other people 
or the indigenous people living in their land. <coughs> Later on, it became like the 1948, but before that, and this is related to the book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, when the Zionist leaders, they had that meeting in the Red House in Herzliya, in that near Tel Aviv, and they, dis they planned the ethnic cleansing policy. They planned that like village by village, town by town. Among them, of course, Ben Gurion. <coughs> and they start implementing this plan slowly, slowly. Of course, according to the book too, that the British funded and supported the Zionist gangs in that period. And even some of the British officers, they were responsible about the training of the Zionist groups. So according to the book, actually, that quarter million Palestinian refugees uprooted from their villages before any Arab soldier arrived to the area. So it was in 1947. In 1948, actually, 750,000 uprooted from their villages. Quarters, 250,000, they were uprooted before the Arab army. So sometime when we use the terminology, it was a war. Honestly, it's a joke. It wasn't a war. What happened in 1948 wasn't a war. They were like part of the Brazilian refugees uprooted from their villages before the Arab army came to the area. And when we think about the Arab army, who are they? Most of them, they, are, they were volunteers. They were not real army. England, uh, England controlling Egypt, and their army, they were, the Egyptian army, they were nothing like, they were very weak, and there are many researchers about that, actually. The Syrian, the same. The Sudanese, the same. And most of them, they came volunteers. The only officer like documented that period, Jamal Abdel Nasser, when he stuck in Fallujah in 1948. And they were, they were not well equipped to, to challenge the, the Zionist movement. So they were involvement. And we have our case actually in Palestine. We speak about him in the history where many Arab volunteers, they were involved in the Palestinian struggle against the Zionist occupation. The famous case we have, Az al Qassam. I don't know if you. You heard this name. Azdin Qassam is a Syrian fighter came to Palestine. And there were many other, actually, uh, uh, volunteers. In the cemetery uh, in Bethlehem, we have the unknown soldier grave, which many Arabs, uh, volunteers, they were killed and buried there. They are from Sudan, from Morocco, <coughs> from Iraq, from Jordan, from different Arab countries. And they were killed, some of them, even before 1948. <coughs> Anyway, what happened in 1948, it's very, what we call it Nakba in Arabic, catastrophe in English, but it's catastrophe with the political meaning. <clears throat> Nakba, and me, I learned about Nakba from my mom, actually. <clears throat> and my mom told me in 1948, in October 14, 1948, the Zionist groups, they came to the village, they killed three people and they start bombing the village. My mom, like many people in the village, she closed the house with the key, and she took my brother and my sister, and she ran to the mountains not far from the village, because my mom, she thought that after one day, two days, when they stopped bombing the village, she would return back to the village. But they continue bombing the whole area until she find herself on the borders, what we call the Green Line. <coughs> and after that, she moved to the Hesha refugee camp. Here is my village. I will show you. I'm using technology. <laughs> <laughs> this is my village, Zakaria village. You'll see this village more. But this is the picture of my village in 1929. And I find this picture, actually, in one of the churches in Jerusalem when I did my research about my village. <coughs> But the Zenist groups, like they had many, like they, when I said like village by village, they had their own plan. They divided this plan among the gangs in that period. And the people, they were affected. And here we need to remember all the time what happened in 1948, 47 actually, and 48. The Israelis, they had a plan to do some massacres. 
they want to blend. And according to the ethnic cleansing of Palestine book and what happened in that house, the red house, they had the plan to do some massacre to scare the people. And the plan is called the plan Dalet in Hebrew, the plan D. And the plan D, first, they will uproot the people from their villages. Second, they will destroy the houses. Third, they will plant the trees. Lovely, like the Zionists, they love the trees. Mm -hmm. They love environment. <clears throat> but we'll see why they want to plant the trees. And me, in 1998, when Israel celebrated 50 years in Israeli state, with some of the Israeli friends, actually, we succeed to enter to the Zionist archive. A little bit, not everything. And we got some pictures, actually. I will share that with you. This is one of the Zionist groups in Arjur village. It's not far from my village. And you can see, for anyone read Hebrew, can find out. This is Beit Natif village, and here you see the Zionist groups. They are relaxing and cooking. But this house still exists until now. Even if you go to that area, you'll find this house still exists. And when I spoke about destroying the houses, here you can see how they prepare the explosives. And here you see how they bomb it. <coughs> Here they are enjoying in one of the Palestinian houses, the Zionist groups, eating the food, relaxing. And maybe if we go deep sometime do a research, maybe we'll find some leaders in Israel among these faces. I didn't do, but maybe. Even here they celebrate and they enjoy that what they get done from the Palestinian, the Kamel, and they have fun. And this picture actually that's the, in the cover of the book, but this picture I chose it because it reminds me with my mom. She lived with two children and she was walking without shoes. People in Palestine, they were living near the coast. They used the boats and tried to go to Lebanon. Other people, they were arrested. They put them in jail. And here you see, they were waiting for some for a few days, few months, and after that they transferred them. Anyone read Hebrew? Yeah. What's what this? does it say? Gaza? Kedima uh, something? To Gaza. Uh, it looks like uh, something from the Bible. Something go to Gaza. But yes, it, this is the Gaza. bus take the people to Gaza. Huh? After they uproot the view, they put them in buses, they transfer them to Gaza. But I want you to look here, what you see. This sign. Military police. Sahal, yeah, Sahal. And this picture all the time, like when I saw this picture, come on, in 1948, it's not that far from the Holocaust. Mm. Even the way how they wear it, and until now they wear it, of course. But this is not far. Even they, they copy it. And this is the shock. Until now, if you interview or meet anyone from the catastrophe generation, we will realize the shock that the people, they were uprooted. They were farmers living in their land. Suddenly, they became refugees. And this is the psychological impact. This is another representation, actually, in Palestinian refugees, especially the catastrophe generation. And how the new generation inherited this psychologically uh, in Barts, until now, still affect the new generation, including me. <clears throat> and here, the five, this is when we speak about what's going on in the Arab world right now and the Middle East. We need to keep this map in our mind. This is the five direction where 750,000 Palestinians uprooted from 531 villages. They moved toward five directions, to Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, West Bank, and Gaza. And here, like when we think about what's going on right now, it will impact. Right now, do you have how many Brazilian refugees we have right now? Seven, seven, Three? Seven million plus. Seven million plus. In 1948, 750,000, they became seven million plus. 
We are very active people. We make children very fast. <laughs> and now in Lebanon, we have around 600,000 Palestinians living in this period, refugees. In Syria, we have over 600,000, and some of them became refugees again. I will speak about it later. In Jordan, we have 2.5 million people, Palestinian refugees living in Jordan, and in West Bank, and in Gaza Strip. Now, in 1948, beginning of 1949, the Red Cross, you, of course, you hear about the United Nations. They are, took responsibility to relieve the Palestinian refugees, right? But actually, in 1948, the Red Cross International, the first international organization, they took this initiative to relieve Palestinian <coughs> refugees, and they built 58 refugee camps. In Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, West Bank, and Gaza Strip. In Gaza, we have eight refugee camps. In West Bank, we have 19 refugee camps. And the rest, it's in Lebanon, Syria, and in Jordan. Anyone from Syria, refugee camps, Lebanon? No. It's okay. From Syria. Yeah. So, we are divided at the personal level, actually. And by the way, my name is Ziad. Ziad means extra, additional. <laughs> I'm the youngest one in my family, and I came by mistake. This is what my mom told me. <laughs> so they gave me the name Ziad. <laughs> and this is the truth, actually. <laughs> and, and actually, my brothers, we, I have two brothers and two sisters. And this is like most of the Russian refugees the same. I have some of my nephews living in Lebanon now. My sister and her, some of her children living in Syria. And I have a brother living with his children in Jordan. And the rest we are living in West Bank. And we are two here in the United States recently. But in fact, this is the way how we were divided. I saw some of you more than I saw my sister. I don't know my sister very well. Because my sister, after 67, she joined the revolution, she and my brother, and they were in Jordan, 1970, they went to Lebanon and Syria. <clears throat> and I didn't my, met my sister only a few times in my life. But in fact, we are five brothers and sisters. The only time we met to have a cup of tea together, it was in 2005. Since 67 until 2005 before my sister passed away. And most of the Brazilian refugees like this. I don't know how many of you saw this film for my Masri Frontiers of Dreams and the Borders. Anyone saw this film? When the Palestinian, after the Israeli would withdraw from South Lebanon, and the Palestinian, they met each other for two weeks. They start coming to the borders, meeting each other. I saw some people. They met their sisters or brothers the first time in 50 years. Of course, they are connected by generation. And I recommend this film. You should see it. But it shows you how much the Palestinian refugees divided. And it's not possible. And now thanks for Skype. I meet my nephews and nieces most of the time on Skype. We meet each other. But we don't have like any connections in our daily life. Like I know them well. And in general, actually in my family, we, I have 27 nephews and nieces. Two brothers, two sisters, 27 nephews and nieces. As I said, we are very active. <laughs> so I will go very fast. Refugee camps. This is my refugee camp, the Hesha refugee camp. Anyone visited the Hesha? Only a few. But this is like the beginning, 1948, 1949, the refugee camp. My family thought it was here, this side. This is part of the, one of the pictures in the camp. This is the school in the camp. But this is like in the beginning, before they built the real school. Here is this picture, 1956, and here they built the school. This is the, this, the, the, the uh, United Nations office here, where they used to distribute food. And here when we speak about refugees, I want you to think about this all the time. <coughs> refugees, it's not something like just statistics or abstract we can do a research about. Refugees, it's a life, how the people they grew up in. And here, in front of this place, I used to stand here with the group of my generation. I was born in 1964, and here I speak about 1968, 69, 70, 71, 72, <coughs> until 1974. We used every day to wait in line to receive food from United Nations. 
And we use to receive the, the food in this way. The plate in your hand, your shoulders like this. And every day you stand to receive the food. And you are waiting, all the time you are waiting in the camp. <clears throat> the idea here when we speak about, this is the way how we grew up. And here we speak about hundreds of thousands of people, generation after generation, they grew up in this way. Here, other picture for some people might come. This is the house, looks the same house, not my house, but one of the rooms where I was born. I was born in this kind of room. And we had one room, 81 square feet, nine feet by nine feet. As, as you know, we are five brothers and sisters and two parents, seven people living in 81 square feet. And this is one of the pictures inside the houses. You can see here, they have bigger family actually, within inside the house. This is like how the people, they were trying to survive. And this picture reminds me with my mom and the water issue. We spoke about water crisis in Gaza and what's going on in Gaza. And this is like something related to our daily life. And one of the actually issues I, it affected me a lot when I was young, watching my mom and my sister carrying the water all the time in their head. And it wasn't for one week or one month or one year. You grow up and watching them. And my mom actually, before she passed away, when I used to see her muscles here, her muscles like if she participated in the international competition <laughs> for bodybuilding, she will win. <laughs> and all her generation will win. And this is an issue actually not just in Palestine, even in Africa and Latin America. This is the struggle of our women. Part of their simple struggle, they never went to school. They didn't go to universities, but they learned and they know how to survive. And this is how they build this kind of muscles in their shoulders. Two things I enjoy last four years here in the United States. First, I can shower every day. Second, I can drive where I want. And this is a fact. This is, if you ask me, my privilege here in the United States, two things. Because I used to shower one time a week. And we could then to travel where we want. Between checkpoint and the other checkpoint, you don't need to walk that much fast. It's very close to each other. And with water issue, actually, it's another representation about water. But this is one of the way how the Israel they apply the apartheid policy against the Palestinian, the distribution of water, because they are controlling right now seven aquifers, four inside Israel, three in West Bank, and one in Gaza Strip. And one in Gaza Strip, 95 percent, according to Amnesty International and United Nations reports, polluted. It's not, you can't drink it as a human being. This is why we work in Mecca to build water purification system, and we cooperate a lot with the Richard Curry Foundation, where we build in Gender Gardens inside Gaza to offer the children a clean water. Because this is another way how the people in Gaza, their uh, uh, children in Gaza survive. If they survive the bullets, maybe they will not survive the, the water. 12% of the young deaths in Gaza Strip related to diarrhea. And diarrhea is because of the water. <clears throat> Go fast, another picture for my camp. And the Asha concentration camp. This is one of the slogans actually written on the wall. And here this is part of the collective punishment, how the Israel they use to punish the people. They, they actually uh, closed, sealed 14 entrances in my refugee camp. They built the fence. Of course, you see the wall, building the walls. But here it's the fence that was built in 1985 until 1995. Me personally, and all the people in my refugee camps, they spent over 10 years behind this fence. This is my camp, actually. This is the Hershey refugee camp. And look to the roofs of the houses, how it's changed. Water just to survive. Here it's another issue. This, this picture actually, me and my nephew, we took these pictures. I am part of my work as a journalist, but this is in front of my camp, the way how they used to come and arrest and attack the camp. And here I want to ask the people in the conference, next time I ask you, please, 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 have a special section about Palestinian political prisoners. <coughs> This is something very important. 
and I would go very fast. <coughs> this is why my English is not good. I learned English inside jail. <laughs> and actually, I learned in my school that Columbus discovered America. <laughs> when I went to jail, I find Columbus did not discover America. <laughs> and there is a guy here who spoke about Bobby Sands. When I went to jail, Palestinian prisoners, the small room, when I came, they said, this is the, the room called Bobby Sands. And me, I was naive. And I said, who is, who is this person who have a strange name, Palestinian Bobby Sands? Who is Bobby Sands? <laughs> and later I learned about Bobby Sands, 68 days in the hunger strike until he died. But he created a history. <clears throat> and recently, when we speak about prisoners, we know Samurai Isawi's story. Mm -hmm. We know all the hunger strike. We need to keep all the time, this is part of the, part of the, our struggle as Palestinians, that the political prisoners all the time, they need to be in the heart of any agenda. Right now we have 4,900 prisoners, among them 239 children, among them 39 children actually, they're aged between 12 and 15 years old. This moment, I speak with you, they are in jail right now. And this is something very important, I speak about it. I experienced jail. They caught me throwing stones when I was young. And I grew up, continued to go to jail. And most of my education, I got it inside jail by other prisoners, which I am very proud of. OK, we'll go. Other pictures in front of the camp, more. Childhood, our children. This is Zakaria right now. And here we speak about the issue of right of return. And one of the things I will recommend, I'm not give it to the end of the, my presentation. In any work we do, we need to keep right of return the center of our world. If you are in solidarity with the Palestinian or not, if you ignore it or you speak about it, it's there. The key of the peace in the Middle East is right of return. Any group, any activity, right of return, this is the way how we can measure things. Where we are standing, how much we are close to the Palestinian and solidarity with the Palestinian, how we measure things with right of return, to be honest with you. Because it's impossible to achieve peace in the Middle East without justifying two-thirds of the Palestinian people. And while he's here, no, he's kept. We were speaking yesterday, while from Safad, I don't know how many of you know Safad. Mm -hmm. Safad is Mahmoud Abbas village too. And yesterday we were joking with each other. I told them, hey, Mahmoud Abbas doesn't want Safad because Mahmoud Abbas, the head, the president of Palestinian Authority, he said, I don't want to go back to Safad. Mm -hmm. But Wael told me, no, I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the issue. It's not right of return. It's not collect, just collective right. It's individual right too. And we need to focus on that. And when I spoke about like why they planted trees, these mountains was empty. Israel's they planted trees to erase history, the history of Palestinian. And they different they use different kind of myth to do that. And by whom they plant the trees? By your money. they they of course they the Zionist movement they use that it's a promised land from God. And I think here in this country they use the manifest destiny, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. And manifest destiny, promised land, sometimes you think God is real estate agents and down <laughs> <laughs> and distributing lands to the people. They like this people and God doesn't like the Native American, doesn't God doesn't recognize the Palestinian people. Or any other people in the world, they face the same cause. <clears throat> But this is like show you Zakaria right now. We have many Israelis that are living in the village right now. Many times I went, I was working with different actually films. We went there, we were filming, and each time we go there, we had a fight because they don't want to see us there. Even to come to visit, they don't want us to see. This is another picture for my village later. And this is our research actually as a people from my village. And I know it's an Arabic language, but this is one of the ways how we try right now 
to document everything in our villages. This is the map of the village before 1948. <clears throat> and they destroyed the village, and as you see here, they built the new houses in the two pictures. Look, they destroyed everything, and they built except the mosque, the school, and one of the houses. What we did, some engineers, people they used to live in the village, and we succeed to go back, and to have a map to the village and for each house, for each family where it used to be. And you can see all the names of the people they used to live in the village. And here is my father, name, Abbas Shamrud. He was the barber, cutting hair. And all the houses, it's, it's here. They planted trees to erase the history, but we need to try to protect this land. And this is one of the ways. And right now, I don't know how many of you heard about Salman Abu Sitta, the Palestinian researcher. They are doing for each village like this. But this is like our initiative, like this is 10 years ago, to do it in our refugee camp. And many other Palestinian refugees right now, they do this to have a maps <coughs> for their own villages. <coughs> My mom coming from other village, but here I want to share this picture. It's called Nature Reserve. <laughs> where destroyed everything at only free place where the Israel is. They can go there and have fresh air and hiking and have barbecue. And actually in that area, you have like the land belong to 13 villages. In that area, it's only national park where the Israel, they can go and walk. Part of our programs we were working in Dehesha, we used to take the children. And I don't want to emphasize a lot. If there's any question, I can explain about it, actually. How the impact of the first visit for me to visit my villages. I will go quick. This is some of the pictures I took, like, when I was working with Ida to take the children to meet their villages. From where they get the funds and building the national park? From you guys. I'm so sorry, but this is a fact. <laughs> Kansas City, from everywhere. You'll find signs from everywhere. Montana, Seattle, these are the people they are building. So when Nada will speak about BDS movement and how much it's important later, mm -hmm. this is the connection. This is the way how they build Israel. Mm -hmm. How many billion dollars the United States give to Israel every year? Yeah. Yeah. Officially yeah. three point something. Mm -hmm. Unofficially closer to 10 billion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, yeah, unofficially, and this is very important, this is why I asked, $2.1 billion go every year from a charitable support from organization in the United States. It's not including as a support coming from you, the government. The Zionist organizations and the lobby and the big companies, $2.1 billion charitable organization goes to Israel to do this. And GNF, Jewish National Funds, they are the... And GOs are shared. They should take them to the court. They have offices all everywhere in the in the world, actually, right now as organization. You know this map. Nothing left. The keys. I still have the keys. And here, when we speak about what's going on in the Arab world, that I will go very fast. But before that, I want to say one thing. Do you remember when I said our shoulders like this? And of course, me personally, most of my body, when I was young, the food came from the United Nations. <coughs> the milk, the food, the rice, etc. But we Palestinian refugees <coughs> everywhere, we succeed to move on with our life. My shoulders was like this because we were defeated. But look, my shoulders right now, it's very up. I'm very proud of who I am as a Palestinian refugee. And all refugees, they are very proud because we didn't give up our struggle, and we are moving with our life, and we continue our struggle. Now 65 years on the Belasian Nakba, but we are still fighting for that, and we try to go back. And when we speak about the scenarios, what could happen <coughs> for Palestine, Palestinians they are struggling, they are using different kind of methods on the struggle, and here I want to be direct. I know in the United States here, they love Gandhi. I love Gandhi too. They love Martin Luther King. I love him too. But I love two Ho Chi Minh guys. Ho Chi Minh who was a fighter for freedom in his country in Vietnam. 
And I love other leaders. They were in Algeria. They struggled against the French, uh, French colonial. I love Mandela, too. <clears throat> Why all the time? I'm not saying Gandhi is not OK. <laughs> but I'm saying, like, when we want to recognize people who struggle, they were amazing nations in this world. They succeed to struggle and end colonialism in their countries. Why do they want us, just the Palestinians, to focus on Gandhi? <laughs> so everything to achieve right of return, everything is open. This is the fact we can't lie about it. We can't be like direct or indirect. People, they have the right to resist that colonialism in the way they choose and the way they want. So what's going on in the Arab world, of course, after all what happened in Tunisia, and no one except expected, actually, Bouazizi, you know Bouazizi? Mm -hmm. The one who set the fire and himself, he will do all this. And of course, they didn't come randomly or spontaneous. They were like accumulation in the Arab world. And this accumulation is still built up right now. And I can't call it revolution, to be honest with you. I can't call it revolution. Because what I learned that revolution dismantled the system, destroyed the whole system, and they bring a new system, right? What we see right now in the Arab world still, we didn't see the system collapse. We saw the head of the system collapse, but the system is still there. So we are still in the beginning. But one of the most important things happened in Egypt and in in Tunisia and give the spark and right now everywhere happening despite the fact we agree or disagree around Syria or around Yemen and around Libya and still coming soon I hope in Jordan and more, more others but there is something happened in the Arab street and North Africa that the people there they break the barriers with fear they are not afraid anymore and they know how to do the changes and this has impacted us as Palestinians. Impact us in very, very positive way. When I think about right of return in the future, and here I will share with you, I'm sure some of you experienced that, and maybe some of you were there. Immediately in May 2011, do you remember what happened? <clears throat> May 2011? With, after all these changes, the Palestinian organized Palestinian refugees, young generation, with their families, they decided, okay, we want to have a scenario. We'll try to go back to Palestine. And they went to the borders from Syria, from Lebanon, from Jordan, from even from Egypt side. And here's some footages I share with you. This man is carrying his mom to go. And this is the picture actually. <coughs> the way how the people, they were coming, marching toward Palestine. I call it, they are rehearsing. Mm -hmm. Slowly, slowly. <laughs> and this is the picture I love. <laughs> this is Gulan Heights. And look how they cross the borders. Mm -hmm. And this is the scenario actually in our mind. Mm -hmm. This is the way when I speak with my nephews and nieces in Syria, they fed up from the life there. And Palestinian refugees, by the way, they, are not, they didn't assimilate to any, even we are Arabs, religion issue, culture, all, but they didn't assimilate. Only small number where they find their life there. People, they're still living in the refugee camps. People, they are facing different kind of discrimination in Lebanon, in Syria, in Jordan. Honestly, but don't tell anyone, this is a secret. Even in West Bank, we have discrimination against refugees. And after Oslo, because Oslo divided the Palestinian people to two classes, Oslo class and the rest of the community. Right. And most of them refugees. And the refugees, they can feel that, that Oslo class, they are cultivating everything. Mm -hmm. And they look to the Palestinian Authority as it's like Fichy government. You know Fichy government in France? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the same, or like the South Lebanon. And they are serving the Israeli goals and the United States goals. But when I go back, I think about the right of return. This is one of the possibilities, and I believe this is something, it will come. And sometimes I think about it like this. What if, like hundreds of thousands of Palestinian youth, would, they decided with another like half million crazy Arab youth, we want to walk back to Palestine and let them, how many they will kill before we arrive? And they will take their shirts off so they will not see explosives. They are not carrying any guns, just they are marching. This is the impact in the Israeli community right now. Mm -hmm. 
the impact it's not just in Barak fell down. The impact it's not Tunisia government fell down and they have a new. The impact that the the psychological impact in Israel that what's going on in the Arab world is a threat for the future of Israel state. Mm -hmm. And it's a future, uh, it's a threat because what they will do. Israel doesn't build the wall just what Sydney spoke in, in, in Gaza or the wall in West Bank. Israel right now, they're building walls all the borders. Mm -hmm. They build the wall six meters high with Egypt, concrete wall. They are building, they want to build the wall even with Elat right now. They want to build a wall with Jordanian boards, uh, borders. They took all the land mines from that area, preparing. And the, the wall, we know that. If there is a wall, the wall will not stop the wall. But the people try to march back, the wall, maybe it will be an obstacle. Mm -hmm. They are building walls and more walls. And the psychological impact that after what happened in the Arab world right now, and happening, even in short term, we can see it's really very sad because the Arab people, they are very busy with their own issues in Syria and Egypt and Tunisia. But for long term, it's helping, it's feeding, and it's encouraging the Palestinian people to take it more serious <coughs> in the future for toward this issue. And I believe the Israelis, they face this threat coming from the Arab world. The other threat is coming from the demographic issue that the number of the Palestinian people increasing. I speak about Palestinian people living inside Palestine, the whole map, <clears throat> and the number of the Jewish people. According to Ilan Babi and some statistics, 2015, 2016, the number will be equal. Without the Palestinian the diaspora, without while. <clears throat> <laughs> without the Palestinian living, and sorry, <laughs> living the diaspora. <laughs> Only in West Bank and inside Gaza and inside Israel itself, they are matching. And the problem, they can't catch up with us. <laughs> we are moving very fast. This is like I can say in the last Zionist conference in Herzliya, a few months ago, two months ago, this is like the two main threats. Despite the fact what we can see in the Middle East, that this is a little bit sad, slow, but it's going toward that direction. And I will share with you, with you this story. When I was a baby, I used to hear the story from my mom all the time. My mom and my uncle, they refused to do any extension rooms in our house because in their minds, we are going back. And me, I was like dreaming, ah, oh, we are going back. And me, I was thinking that the trucks, you saw the camp, and the trucks will come, <clears throat> line up in front of the camp, will start taking all our furniture, we don't have furniture that much, but, and we started driving back. It was in my dream, like I can imagine it. And even I want to sit down the back of the truck because I want to see the villages. These days I can see this dream, it's very, very possible and it's very soon. Because the Lassian people, refugees, they never give up their struggle and they continue with that because the changes that's happening and because someone like Sydney, she was presenting here about Rachel Corey and because the BDS and the work you do it here, even in small amount, and because we and South Africa and, and uh, Latin America, we are connecting, we are coming all, learning from each other and we are moving with that. So soon, I, I hope, and we'll be returning back to our homes. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, before we get started with the discussion, I'm going to pass around a sign-up sheet for Super. So this is for folks who want to um, get involved or find out more information and, and build, you know, the BDS struggle um, to win the right of return uh, and the full liberation of Palestine. We have about half an hour of this for a discussion right now. We're going to do this just as other sessions. Um, people can ask questions, make comments. Just raise your hand. I'll call. I don't know most of you here, so I'll call on you by an article of clothing or point at you. Um, and um, that said, let's get started. You can open this. Go ahead. Um, in 1948, what was the neighboring Arab country's reaction to everything that was happening? 
So the question is, in 1948, what was the neighboring country's reaction? Maybe we'll take a few questions before handing it back to Zia. And other people can talk to it as well. Hi. Um. Uh, thank you, Ziad. I had the privilege of taking a workshop um, that the Peace Works Foundation put on. Um, Rachel's core parents were in Israel, but it was, it was amazing. We talked about BDS, and you, he talked again about that, where you're standing in relation to all these things. And so I think that sharing that again was very powerful for me. The thing that um, I have heard from um, the amazing Palestinian people have um, had the um, chance to meet here in the States since I haven't gotten to travel there yet and other people involved and other indigenous people that I've met and I think this needs to be driven home resilience is not justice just because they carry on with their lives a genocide happens they get kicked out of their homes all these things and they learn to have dignity and and keep their humanity is not justice and I have heard that rhetoric from people in different college classes they're like well they look like they're doing pretty fine I'm like that is not okay so we need to stand in solidarity. And I said it this morning um, with the Corys, and I said it yesterday, and I really do believe that standing in solidarity with Palestinian people is a litmus test for how we handle human rights here in the United States. With everything we're doing, this is such a big issue, and that, that struggle's been going on, like I shared yesterday, about, you know, I think 1891. I mean, that's a long, that has a long history. That's a long struggle, we've come really, really far. Um, the other thing I wanted to share is if folks haven't seen Five Broken Cameras, I really encourage you to go watch that. It starts during lunch. Look at your, um, your schedule to see this at 1 o'clock. Okay. Um, we had done a screening here at PSU of that, and it was, it was very powerful for me. It just reiterated so many things. But um, along with your very personal story and the way you, know, you use humor and you, you talk about your experience in a way that I think people can very tangibly or try to put themselves in your, as much as they can in your shoes. I feel like Five Broken Cameras does that as well. It's a very visceral, as much as you can without being there. What it's like to raise your family and try to keep your dignity, and his wife is absolutely amazing. And the children, his son growing up from a baby to, you know, and, and if you want to see a portrait of nonviolent resistance that's powerful, that's going to move our movement forward, along with BDS and all the other things, I really encourage you, if you can't get to the film, get it at the library, I mean, do what you can, but I want to encourage folks in the room to see that, because it, along with what Ziada said, I think it's a really powerful speech, so thank you. Thanks, Kate. Um, sure, so I'll, I have you, and before you speak, um, people can raise their hands um, while other people are, are uh, speaking, and I'll take a list. So go ahead, and then after. Well, Ziad, I want to thank you. This, it's so inspiring to, to think about a future with the right of the Palestinians to return. I guess I'd just like to hear you think, what does that future look like? What would that, that society look like, that future uh, that we can hope for? And on the right, in the, yeah. in the gray, gray shirt. I had a s similar attitude. If 94% if of the land was stolen from Palestine, and it was, what would the right of return look like? Right now. So basically, I would like to uh, give my input to this discussion in terms of all of the questions that have been raised. What would the right of return, right of return look like? Uh, and, uh, you know, the one thing that I want to say is I am totally 100% with Ziad. Ignore your rights and they will go away. We have not ignored their rights. I mean, the, our rights. The one thing that Israel wants us to do is to ignore our rights. The one thing that the negotiators and the peace talks and everything is, wants us to do is ignore our rights. Ignore your rights and they will go away and we have not ignored them. We will maintain them until we actually achieve our rights. But what I would like to contribute at some point as, as we open up the discussion is my own thoughts also on what the right of return looks like, what, what it would look like today when 94% of the land has been stolen and you know these things. And I also want to say that uh, parallel to the five broken cameras uh, this afternoon. I'm actually also giving a talk uh, <laughs> that is not as personal as Ziyad's. I am a Palestinian. My, both of my parents are from Jerusalem and were expelled in 1948. So I also have the personal narrative and all of that. But I'm giving a talk that is more of the historical contextual uh, analysis of what settler colonialism is, what apartheid is, what strategies to use. And I think that my talk really, I mean, I, I, even though I have heard Ziad give this before a few times. I think I sat here and I was absorbing this in terms of like what, I, what I'm gonna say later. And uh, so if you have seen Five Broken Cameras, 
come to my talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, in the white shirt? Yes. Yeah, I would like uh, to move to the error of spring theme a little bit. Uh, I would like to get Zian's uh, take on what's actually going on in Syria, uh, which is a very murky situation, and what the implications, potential implications, are for uh, the Palestinian cause. Uh, here in the red shirt and then in the back. Uh, Thank you, Zia. Uh, that, that picture is kind of haunting me because I was in the Golan Heights uh, quite recently and shown the spot where people march, and I'm forgetting the number now, but about 15 or 20 people were killed, yes. I think. And I'm just wondering if you know if, I, I realize I don't know what's happened, if there's been any attention to what happened to those people. Yeah, that would be, uh, yeah. yeah. Good. I'll show you another one. The other, the other thing I'll say about that kind of ties to the Syrian question. Um, a friend who, who wanted very much for us to go to the Golan then called because they became aware, they assumed that the, the Syrians who were in the Golan Heights uh, would all be supportive of the revolution, but found that they weren't, that there was division there. It was interesting for us to meet with different families, so I thought you might come. Yeah. So we have quite a few questions for Ziad, so I'm going to call the next two people and then hand it back to Ziad to come back on some of them. So in the back, and then in the front. Do um, you write a question? Excellent. Yeah. I just wanted to make a quick comment and share an experience. I was in the West Bank in September, and there was a lot of Yeah, I just wanted to share a thought. It's really, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. And it's so helpful to be able to see the parallels between constantly illustrated the United States and settler colonialism in, in Israel. But it makes me concerned in terms of given our history, our legacy as a settler colony in the United States, the constraints that puts on, on the political imagination here and the movement that needs to come up with support. Here in the United States, American Indians on reservations are refugees. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we call, where the, but we, we've named that American Indian self-determination. Mm -hmm. And if that's our conception of what self-determination means, and we're willing, e even progressive Americans, to, to live with that, what are the implications for Palestinian people? Thank you. I will try to catch up. But if I forget something, let me know. I will try as much as I can. The first question, Hani asked about the reaction of the Arab. Well, he's, he's scared, actually. He's smart. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the reaction was, as I spoke a little bit about it, like they were Arab volunteers, no doubt. The Arab people, they were in with the Palestinian people. But the Arab regimes, they were very weak. They were like under the British mandate in, in Egypt and Syria, the French, and they were like really very weak and they didn't have really strong army. If they had strong army, they would fight the British and the French in that period, not just come to Palestine. But despite the fact that the few thousand they came actually, and among them they were Jamal Abdel Nasser Nasser, and he stuck the siege in Fallujah for like maybe a, a month there, they were without, they were counting with, and I used to hear the story, they were counting how many bullets they have and very old bullets. The Brazilian, they were fighting in that period. Some of the Brazilian, they were arrested. And I don't know how many of you heard about like the strike in 1936, which Osan he wrote about that. The strike for six months when the Brazilian, the seaboard, Haifa seaboard, like s s closed totally in 1936. And the people, they were fighting and protesting against the Zionist immigration and the plan. They felt the conspiracy is coming. Even the British in that period, they had the emergency laws, 100, uh, 1945, that the Palestinians, they are not allowed to have guns or bullets. Or, and some people, they lost their life just because they have a gun. 
because the British they were supporting the the, the, the Zionist movement in that period. So that uh, the, the the Arab world they were in a very bad situation. They are, were not capable to fight the Zionism and to do like to defeat Zionism because Zionism in that period and they were very well prepared. They had air forces, they had tanks, they had jeeps, they had guns, they had everything, and they had the capacity, the the, the human resource like other. Uh, uh, officers coming from England and from many other countries, they were volunteers to support the Zionist movement in that period. This is one. Concerning the solidarity you spoke about, and all the time I, I tried, this is another like workshop, when the people, because we, you know, with the people they start speaking about solidarity, sometimes the people misunderstanding. And here I'm not offending anyone, because I used to live in the refugee camp, and all the time international people, they come different people, different backgrounds, and they leave. And for them it's solidarity. For me it does not make any sense, some of them, or most of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm direct with that, but the idea is sometimes when we do, if you want to learn about oppression, to be honest with you, don't come to Palestine. Open the window from your house, you will see the oppression outside. If you want to learn about oppression, because in this country, the oppression is unbelievable. If you want to learn about refugees, don't come to Palestine. Go to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. You will find refugees, they are still there. I'm not saying don't come, you can come, but <laughs> if this is the idea. There is a connection. If we are in solidarity all the time, we need to examine ourselves where we are standing with any people living under oppression, here in the United States or outside internationally. And you need to measure where I'm standing. I'm really in solidarity or just just I feel like emotional support toward these people. Or I am like, I have some time, I want to do something and build my CV. I have six months Peace Corps in Guatemala. No, I'm not saying why. <laughs> but the idea is, the idea is solidarity and to be in solidarity with other people because the, and struggle, struggle it's not occasional. Struggle it's a lifestyle. When they speak about me, sometimes introduce me as an activist, I feel angry. I'm not an activist, I'm not intellectual. I am refugee, this is my cause, this is who I am. And struggle is like this. It's continuous, it's lifestyle. You wake up and you go to sleep and this is the struggle. I'm not saying don't have fun, don't, don't go to the bar, don't have vacation at <laughs> all. No, live your life. But the struggle is coming in everything. I can't pick and choose and to, when I want to do the things. And this is why we did that circle where you stand. Are you with Palestinian struggle or you are in solidarity or you support emotionally? Different, like, you can put yourself in which part of the, the circle where you are standing. Um, the future of Palestine, and here I want to share with you this story. After I visited my village the first time and changed my life, I believe in right of return with my mom. But I changed my life, I visited my village in 1998, the first time. And I visited the two villages with my uncle. When I went to my father's village, Zakaria, the one you saw, it's like, for me, the shock. It's clear they were Palestinian living there. But when I went to Jirash, I thought my uncle, he's expired. He doesn't remember anything about the village. Because nothing there, I didn't recognize anything. And this is what the Zionists did. And my uncle, slowly, slowly when I went there, that <coughs> This is the first time I discovered my uncle. He was 18 years old when he was uprooted from his village. I discovered my uncle, despite the fact he never went to any university or any school. He's an artist. And slowly, slowly he starts speaking about the village, and this is, I noticed, that the, how the history is coming. From the rocks, from the trees, under the trucks. In half an hour, he drew the village in front of me. And this is what the Zionists couldn't erase. I know right now in my mother village each house where it was. Despite the fact it's not there. If you go there, you will not recognize. And this is something like when you think about it, the future. So after that visit, we start organizing a lot, a lot of trips for children to take them. Because it took from me a long time to visit the village. So we start taking children. And this is about the future of Palestine after right of return. One of the workshops we were doing with the children in the destroyed villages there, I asked them, how you see the future of your village if you want to return back? 
I have to be honest with you, some of the children, they draw the villages, they draw the typical Palestinian houses with arches, the balcony, the lamp, the fruits, trees, and they were settlements that built there, they didn't build the settlements. And they asked why, they said, we don't want them. And they asked the children, okay, there are some people living here, what we will do with them if we want to return back? It's our land. And the children, they said, Look, first let us return back. Second, we think about them. I told them, yeah, but where, what we will do with them? And the children, they said, okay, temporary until we find a solution. They can stay in our refugee camps. <laughs> Some of them answered like this. And here I want to be honest with you. Honestly, I don't care. If we want to bring justice, as a victim, it's not my job to think about the future of the victimizer. First, we want to bring justice as indigenous to return back, and here we need to be very careful. I know the people, they speak about like part of Palestine, it's empty right now, refugees, they can come back to their houses. But Haifa, and there are Shlomo's and Yaakov, they are living there, their children born there, they grew up there. Abu Muhammad, he was living there, but he's living in the refugee camp in uh, Lebanon, and his children living in Lebanon. If we speak about indigenous rights, we need to be sharp, direct. This house belonged to Abu Muhammad. And justice, if we want to bring justice, this is according to international law, declaration of the human rights, this house belonged to Abu Muhammad. And later we will think about Shlomo, what we will do. I'm not saying they should leave the country. I'm not saying any. But first, if we want to speak about justice, it's not my job as a victim, as 7 million Palestinian refugees, they need to think about the future of the Israelis, which they used our resources, everything to do that. I know you are in a hurry for that, but I will go more. Around Syria, Syria, it's very complicated issue, but it's very simple at the same time. Complicated because the way the international forces, how they play inside Syria. It's very simple that the Syrian people, they fed up with this regime and they want to get rid from this regime. And this is something very important for the Syrian people. The, the Syrian people call it's very, I say it like me personally, I am with the Syrian people call, but I'm against any, any hands playing outside from Syria. Mm -hmm. This is internally. And here the Palestinians, we are paying the price in Syria too. Over 500 Palestinians killed since this, what happened from the Yarmouk refugee camp and other refugee camp killed. Tens of thousands, they are in, uh, refugees again in Lebanon and in Jordan borders right now. We are affected very badly, and part of our work in Mecca actually, what we send medical shipments now to Lebanon and to Jordan for the Syrian refugees and Palestinian refugees in the borders. In Syria, an issue that the Syrian people, they need to find a way how to handle this and to stop that, let the other hands playing rules inside Syria, and they need to decide their own future. We Palestinian, we need to keep ourselves not involved that much because we are with the Syrian people call. What they will call, we are with them. But we Palestinian, we are divided. Between this and this, like the Syrian people, they are divided. Between this and this. <clears throat> any, I didn't answer any other questions? There's a comment about uh, American Indian question as well. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and this is something, and when I say about Abu Muhammad House, do you remember I said that Abu Muhammad House, they should, he should go back to his house? And we should not think about the victimizer that much, what we will do with the victimizer? I want to share with you this experience, and I know you know it. You know what happened in South Africa? After Mandela, he won the election. In the apartheid system, everyone, one person, one vote, no apartheid system, everything is okay, lovely, everyone celebrated. You know now, 2013, over six million landless in South Africa. Mm -hmm. They still live in the townships. Mm -hmm. We are not stupid Palestinian. We don't want to do it again like what happened. Mm -hmm. The South African, they are telling us, hey, don't do, be careful. And actually, many South Africans came to Palestine and like, this is like back and forth. We will not repeat this again. Mm -hmm. If you want to bring a solution, the landless people, they are living in the townships in South Africa after since 1994 until now, 
we need to have solution for them and we don't want to return back to our refugee camps. Mm -hmm. If there is right of return, people they have the right to return back to their origin villages. Because the white people, the 8 million, they were controlling South Africa for hundreds of years, they are living in their privileges in Cape Town, mm -hmm. in their islands, in their places, and still the black South African, they are living in the townships. So we need to be very careful. When we speak about the indigenous people, the reservation for me, I went to the reservations in New Mexico, here in California, and yes, there are refugee camps, the same. And it's very well connected to each other. And here I speak about it. I'm very careful to say anything in the United States. But I say, this is why I said, manifest destiny, promised land. This is what I said, the struggle here, the struggle there. And at least, this is why I said Columbus discovered America. No, Columbus did not discover America. This is why, and during what you call it Thanksgiving, I find myself with other bunch of Palestinians all the time in Alcatraz with the Native American commemorating their Nakba. So this is struggle connected to each other, absolutely. And this is what Howard Zen said, actually. This is, the, we need to rewrite the history in the right way and educate our new generation and recognize the people rights. And without this, we are fake. I'm sorry, Yanni. Mean, we struggle to feel good, but we need to recognize these kind of rights, and this is very important. Thanks, Yanni. Yeah. Um, so, I just want to make an announcement before we go back to discussion. It's 1242 right now. This session was going to end at 1245, but we started about 15 minutes late. Um, if people do want to leave for the screening of five broken cameras, that is supposed to start at 1, may start a little bit later, but it's also during lunch break. So, if you do want to go to do that, that's, you, know, you should feel free to excuse yourself. Otherwise, we'll continue for another 15 minutes. So I just have um, Sarah on the list, um, and then open list. So raise your hand if you want to get on the discussion stack. Um, I have a question. Just, you mentioned the, um, how Israel is trying to build a wall around um, the border with the Gaza Strip. Do you think that that is going to be accepted and not speak the democratic movement inside Israel or outside? The, how you said there's an interest in building a wall around yeah, yeah, yeah. like to prevent like either movement of refugees or just Egyptians organizing to, to help open yeah. up those barriers. So I'm just interested in learning more about okay. well, um, Adam and then the blue flag. Uh, thank, thank you again for your discussion. Um, I, I know you touched on it a couple times, but I was curious uh, to, to hear some more about uh, the younger generation and the education that they're receiving right now. Um, there's a lot of examples in history of <coughs> co-opting of education for very deliberate reasons, including here in the US and Australia, uh, et cetera. Um, and you mentioned just the education and, and refugee camps, and I, I was just curious to see how, how that identity uh, that you took from your family, how you carried that, and, and how maybe an educational system can help enrich that as well. So I have right here in the blue plaque, and then you. Um, I wonder if you might uh, address the issue of con the ongoing Israeli settlement building on formerly Palestinian lands. It seems to me that that represents a, a truly insoluble problem as long as Jewish people the world over have the right of, well, the right of immigration to Israel, return as maybe or maybe not an appropriate word in that context, but um, you've spoken a lot about the right of return in reference to Palestinians' rights to return to their lands, their families' homes that they were evicted from. Um, as long as uh, Jewish people the world over have the right to emigrate to Israel, I suppose the state of Israel feels it has the obligation to provide housing for those Jews who come back to that land and that they call Israel, and uh, you know, is there room as long as uh, that policy remains, then uh, more and more land is going to be taken for use by the state of Israel and, and its citizens and less available for uh, the people who occupied it before the nation of Israel was ever established. Mm -hmm. um, I have the person here in the white shirt and hat, and then if anybody else um, wants to maybe raise, ask a question, just raise your hand now, because I think I'm going to kick it back to Ziad after this. I'd like to make just a few comments. Um, for example, most of 
your um, Israel lobby groups like J Street, for example, and uh, uh, are very much against the right of return. They like to present the idea that, you, that it goes from the APAC to the J Street element, uh, as far left as J Street. But they might not understand that there are Jewish people who do advocate the right of return. Uh, for example, this woman that sits here, I happen to know, signed uh, a Jews for Palestinian right of return statement that one can find on the internet and on Facebook. I actually, in my community, I actually ran an ad uh, in our weekly paper, it sticks around for a week, uh, promoting the Jews for Palestinian right of return. I run another ad for American Muslims for Palestine. So without any affiliation to our organization on that awareness project. And I have another ad in the queue for Jews for Palestinian right of return with the uh, Dr. Sarit Makdisi's quote promoting this. The, the first ad actually had their photo with the wall uh, and the statement, two states equal um, segregation and, and apartheid. I think it's very important to let people know that there are Jewish people and Jewish organizations like Zokot and Works with the Deal for that right of return. Um, unfortunately, because of the systemic racism we live in, um, people have a tendency to uh, listen more to Jewish voices than Palestinian voices. And it's really unfortunate. Um, but our community, our university itself, was ranked by APAC as the most, most pro-Israel campus uh, in, the, in the U.S. as far as activism. And I think it's really important to chip away at that image that, that these people are, you know, that it cannot work. It could work. If one democratic state, the right of return could work. We need a constitution. We need legislative equality like we have with an establishment clause. A constitution. As MLK said, you, you cannot make people love me, you cannot legislate morality, but if you keep them from lynching me, I think that's pretty important. We cannot wait until people have a change of heart. People do not give up power voluntarily. We cannot wait for that. Um, so before I hand it back to Ziad, I um, just want to make a quick announcement. Um, in the book room, just right over here, uh, where there was coffee earlier, and, and books, um, there's going to be an informal lunch uh, with pizza provided for folks who are involved in campus BDS activity. So if you're part of a group and you're involved in BDS activism on campus, um, you know, head over, head on over there for an informal lunch. With and the pizza. books there. And the books as well. And yes. if an expensive book is there. Um, so go ahead, yeah. Okay. Concerning Sarah' question about the borders, yes, what Israel is doing right now, and almost done with part of the wall they are building with Egypt for different reasons. The issue that the Egyptians in the future, if they plan and the Palestinians to use that part to return back. Second, because there were many African workers, they tried to smuggle to inside Israel and to go to work there and maybe if you go to YouTube and many reports about that, the discrimination they are facing right now inside Israel, all the African communities they are living inside Israel. And there were a lot of protests actually there and even they call it like they don't want to have black people inside Israel. <clears throat> even they have the Jewish from, there are some Knesset members, not everyone. But this is like the issue right now, the psychological impact. And I met you know, some Israelis, like they are living outside right now. And some of my friends, we were used to work in a human rights organization in Palestine. They decided to leave Israel. And when I asked my friend, why do you want to leave? She said, I don't want my children to grow up here, and I don't feel any secure. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, she said that the house I live right now, even with Jerusalem and Ain Karim, she was living. And she said, the house in Ain Karim is for Abu Muhammad mm -hmm. and living, so she doesn't want to be barred. And here <coughs> is something very important. The walls came because the psychological impact mm -hmm. on side the Israeli community. Second, because if we look to the statistics of the Israelis, they are leaving Israel. They don't speak about it that much. There are many, many, many Israelis leaving Israel. They don't feel secure. They don't want their families to live in Israel anymore. Yes. Of course, on the other side, the right wing, they are going there. And on the other side, you will have part of Brooklyn City, they have two citizenship. Brooklyn and Kiryat Arba in Hebrew, right? Most of them, they are living in Kiryat Arba and Efrat and all these kind of settlements. Which they are coming, they come here, work six months, go back there, working six months, and to protect the land. And they still expand the settlements. Now this kind of, 
the, the, I call it the liberal, liberal inside Israel, they are really scared. The right wings, no, they are escalating. Even they are calling to uproot all the Palestinians living inside Israel to get rid from the number. And actually, in, in Herzl, the last conference, they spoke about that, that there is an opportunity. The Arab world is very busy. No one pay attention. This is good for us to take cities like Emil Fahim or Bart of Nasra and throw them out. There were some calls from intellectuals and from the right wings. Now, uh, now they want to annex all the sea area. Yeah. And leave only a, a, a just building that gets surrounded by Israeli sovereignty. Exactly. So they were like some sorts, even among the radical uh, wings. Now, in general, Israel, they are scared the psychological impact, and they are scared because even after the war with Gaza. The first war and the second war. And the second war, and this is like, I know the Palestinian missiles, it's like rockets, homemade, ve vegan, we call it. <laughs> the Palestinian rockets, vegan. Doesn't that hurt that much, but of course, it's make the people scared. Of course, sometimes it kills. And here, this is the first time in the history of the Palestinian struggle you have that Palestinian fighters with their tiny arms and their homemade, they are not far from the borders. Last November, Israel, the alarms on in Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv. And this is something in you. This is without Lebanon, without Syria. And think about it in the future. What if, if West, West Bank, it will be like this, like Gaza? How Israel will survive? You don't need rockets, you need slingshots in West Bank to get to the settlements, or even from Ramallah, how much to reach. And this is the Israel, they think about it. Not just Palestinian, they think about it. The Israel, they think about it all the time. What, the way how it is developed. And this is make them feel like uh, insecure. And in the other issue, Palestine, it's the, in the heart and the brains of the Arab people, no matter what's going on. And the Arab people will not accept. Like anyone believe in justice, I'm not saying Arab different from the rest of the world. Who was thinking that one day Mubarak will be in the court? In the dream, yes, we were looking for this moment, but this is the movement. Who was thinking that Bin Ali will escape from uh, Tunisia running? But this is like the movement of the people. There is a movement moving inside us and among us, etc., with our struggle. And this movement someday, of course, you can, it's accumulation. Slowly, slowly build up. And this is why Israel try to protect themselves. This is why some of the funds coming from the United States more and more to Israel, because the Israel, they don't feel secure anymore. It's not the question the Air Forces or the nuclear weapons. The question is the people, the number of the people. What if they decided this is the way how we want to go back and just, and it could happen. I'm not saying something coming from the, the moon, but it could happen any moment. Could then concerning education, yes. But just I want to remind you that we never, if you go to any textbook in Palestine, between 1967, uh, sorry, 1948 until 1993, you will not find any word about Palestine from Israeli side. Between 1967 and 1993, all the books in West Bank and Gaza Strip, you will not find the word Palestine in any book or any map. Even our books. It was censored by the Israelis. You are not allowed to have the, the word Palestine like printed. It's censored by the civil administration. And this is actually, we used to hide the books like in nuclear weapons, they do. Hide the box in plastic and hide them underground. Anyone knows Ghassan Kanafani? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Ghassan Kanafani is a Palestinian famous writer. He was assassinated in 1972. His books, it's enough. If they find his book in your house, six months in jail, minimum. This is according to military order because the military orders. So the education, you are not allowed to be Palestinian. Not like now, I'm Palestinian and I'm not scared. Yeah. You can do that, like you continue to do that. In that period, we were not allowed. I used, my mom, she used like she was an expert, digging in the, behind my house and hiding books. And some books, it's not something like, even about the Holocaust, we are, we are not allowed to read, even in Palestine. This is according to military law. After 93, it's changed. Now, how the education it came is from 
And I can say it like the Palestinian family, and here I, I relate it to that to the Palestinian women and Palestinian moms. And this is the way how they fueled us. I know my mom, she doesn't want me to be involved in politics, she failed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in the end, the education there, the way how she was taking care of the key of our house, I saw her how she take care of the key. And she was thinking like to hide, she doesn't want me to be involved. And this is the education came slowly, slowly. And by going to jail, the first time I was arrested, I was like 13 years and a half. When I find that promise did not discover America, but I learned a lot. And when you think about the prison, how much shaped the Palestinian characters, I'm not a hero or something, I'm nothing. I feel shy in front of my colleagues in the camp or other camps. You have over 800,000 Palestinians experienced the Israeli jail since 1967 until now. It's a huge number comparing with 4.5 million people living in West Bank and Gaza Strip. 800,000 Palestinians, over 800,000 Palestinians. Jail shaped us. You learn about Guatemala, about Martin Luther King. You learn about uh, South Africa, Vietnam, etc. Even sometimes you learn about uh, Jersey Shore. <laughs> but you learn about everything in the world. You learn. The people teach each other, educate each other. And this is what's maintained the education. The other point, refugee is not we are suffering. Refugee, I'm not, I don't, like when I speak about refugee, I don't want the people to feel sad. Hey, don't feel sad. I'm very proud. Refugee is a question of dignity. Right to Britain, it's a question of dignity. No matter what I will have, which kind of house I will live, where I will be, how come I can, for example, any Palestinian here, American Palestinian, have an American passport? From where are you? Sorry to ask. The Lods. But if you are a Palestinian refugee and you have American citizenship, you can go everywhere you want. But you can't go to live in your village. Because you are Palestinian. And this is the and like the need inside. You still feel refugee. You can't go back. Mm -hmm. Even in Jerusalem, they facing the ethnic cleansing. If she lives outside Jerusalem over three years, she will lose her ID. Go ahead, say something. I think I'll go very fast. She came and she's like angry, maybe she won't pass off. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand. This is part of the ethnic cleansing that the, the people they can't see it except the Palestinian. Yeah. The way how the family reunification, if you married from Jerusalem, like the woman, if you married the woman from Jerusalem and you are from West Bank, you, you can't go to live with her. But it's okay if she wants to live with you. This is the way how they want to clean Jerusalem. 
But then she won't. She will lose her permanent residency. Exactly, she will lose that in, 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 in East Jerusalem to live there. And this is like a lot of laws. They have the Israelis targeting the Palestinian and targeting the Palestinian family to destroy it and to clean Jerusalem. And actually, in your presentation yesterday, you did it very well, that how they targeted even now the neighborhoods to clean Jerusalem. It's, it's, this is the, the Zionism, it's the main issue. And the Zionist plan before 1948, the ethnic cleansing policy in that house is still moving until now, but in different styles targeting the Palestinian. Uh, concerning settlements, yes, the settlements issue, I think we are done with it. The Israelis, they love settlements. They are in a hurry. They want in a hurry. They want to change. They feel there is something coming. They, are, they want to change. And this is the government, how they think. They think that by having land, building houses, try to bring the Jewish here, they will change the fact. But honestly, I don't speak that much about settlement because they destroyed the solution around the two-state solution or etc. Because nothing left in West Bank. Settlement, it shows how much they are like nervous. And by the way, in the history, what we learned from the history, and I'm sure when fascism escalation, when the fascism escalate, or when they feel threat, they escalate a lot using the power. This is what even we saw that with Hitler, we saw that with Mussolini, we saw that in different like colonial states in the, the sorry? We saw that. And Israel right now they are escalating because they feel there is something moving. And we and the Israelis, and this is related to the education. In our education, that's why they couldn't kill the education. They closed the schools for three years in the first intifada. From kindergartens, you are not allowed to have kindergarten to Birzeit University. We used to have a class hiding underground, like you have a military uh, or a, a faction meeting. We, to go to study about, for example, uh, Philippine or geography or history underground in that period, in the first intifada. They target the Palestinian education system, but the Israelis, they failed. They failed terribly, actually, on that, because Palestinians, no matter, look, they grew up in Portland here, and they start searching their identity, and they want to go back. Mm -hmm. And everywhere, not only here, everywhere in this world. And this is something like came where we and the Israelis, we see the same end. We, the Palestinian, and the Israelis, we see the same end. Now, the Israelis, and this is Sharon, what he said in 2002, 2003, we want to make it difficult for Palestinians to achieve what they want. And the Israelis, they try to make it difficult for us to achieve the end, which is ending this incubation, ending the suffering. Palestinians, they want to make it very fast. And now we are living. Who's, who will... They try to put obstacles, we try to go faster. With your war, with this conference, with our war, we'll go faster and faster. And next time you organize activities, not just conferences, activities in the city, boycott, campaigns everywhere, and especially G for us. This is working with the prisoners here and there. This mm -hmm. is a good target. Mm -hmm. And all this kind of struggle, yes, we will move faster and faster. And because I don't think so, we will accept the world that if you are Jewish, you have the right to go to live. No matter where you are, you can go where you want to live in Palestine. And if you are Palestinian, you are not allowed to go to live there. <laughs> and this is, it's coming to the end. This is why we see the same end, both of us. The end, maybe it will take 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, I don't know. But we see the same end, both sides. Thank you.